Hello, and welcome to our program, In the Know, keeping pace with news and updates on COVID-19 vaccines. The CME program is supported by an educational grant from Janssen Therapeutics. Before we start, please take a moment to answer the pre-polls in the tweets below and let us know who you are. This is a CME certified program. Details regarding how to obtain your credit are located in the tweets below. Be sure to watch our handles for additional CME COVID programming as this webinar is the first event in a series of three newsrooms. And follow Bottom CE for CME certified programs on Twitter. I'm Dr. Tara Smith. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist at Kent State University College of Public Health. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Boagu. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Onyema Obuagu. I'm an associate professor of infectious disease in Yale School of Medicine. And our disclosures are shown on your screen. Our program today is the first in the series of newsrooms about COVID-19 vaccine updates. So head to Bonham CE on Twitter to catch up on our other discussions regarding COVID-19 vaccine developments. So the learning objectives today are to one, translate the data regarding clinical trial efficacy and real world effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines that are in use in the United States, to distinguish the data between varying vaccine effectiveness against variants of concern, so these are the topics that we will be discussing today. The first article we'll be talking about is CDC data looking at the efficacy of a third dose of mRNA vaccines against COVID-19 associated emergency department and urgent care encounters, as well as hospitalizations. And this study was done during periods when Delta and Omicron variants were predominant. This was a study from the Vision Network of 10 states, and the study was conducted between August 2021 through January 2022. The purpose of this study was to assess the real-world effectiveness of mRNA vaccines in the US, 14 days to up to six months after second dose, as well as greater than six months after the second dose, and then also 14 days after individuals had received a third dose or booster. I will note that in this cohort, 4% of individuals were immune compromised such that their booster dose was a fourth dose. And again, this study was conducted when we had Delta and Omicron variants of concerns predominating. This was a retrospective cohort study, and this included all US adults within those cohorts age 18 years or older. The time period is as shown. Now, this table shows the vaccination status influence on COVID-19 related healthcare visits. In the left, you see the variant predominance, either Delta or Omicron, stratified by hospitalizations or those requiring emergency department or urgent care visits. Looking at the second column, you can clearly see that majority of these events were adjudicated during the Delta wave. So 92 to 98% of hospitalizations and many of these medically attended visits occurred during the Delta wave. And then based on mRNA COVID-19 vaccination statuses, you start to see a difference between the three groups. To the left are the unvaccinated. In the middle are those who received two doses, but less than six months prior to study enrollment and those who were more than six months after receipt of their two doses. Regarding all emergency department and urgent care visits, you can clearly see that the proportion that were unvaccinated was high as 47%, while that number dropped to 19 and 26% in those who had received two doses with a bit higher percentage occurring in those who'd received two doses more than six months earlier. Looking at the group that received three doses, you can see that that number declined to 8%. Looking at hospitalizations, again, 43% in the unvaccinated, 17% for those who are within six months of two doses, higher in those who received their doses more than six months earlier, and then of course lower in those who received three doses of the vaccines. So clearly we start to see that two doses were much more protective than uh, being unvaccinated. There was a temporal difference between those who had uh, two doses more than six months earlier compared to those who were within six months of receiving their two dose, and then a clear benefit for those who were receiving, uh, who had received three doses or a booster dose of vaccine. When we look at the vaccine effectiveness by the number and timing of doses, this chart clearly shows the vaccine effectiveness stratified by the dosing groups. Again, two doses received within six months 
to doses received greater than six months prior to this study and those who had received a booster dose. When we look at the era of the Delta predominance, we can see again the lowest efficacy among those who received two doses longer than six months prior and then rising to 94% among those who received the booster. We saw a similar effect with Omicron, but pay attention to the lower vaccine effectiveness in those who were in the Omicron era, where we saw much lower protection against emergency departments and urgent care visits, as well as hospitalizations across the board, but even more evident among those who were more than six months out from completing their primary series. Again, the third dose appeared to restore some protection against these medically attended visits and hospitalizations among this group. So in summary, we recognize here by this trial that vaccine effectiveness was significantly higher in patients who were within six months of their primary series compared to those greater than 180 days. Again, that relationship that shows us the time from a primary series matters. We also see that receipt of the third dose was highly effective and restored some of that protection against medically attended visits and hospitalizations even during the Omicron era. And these provide the basis for which uh, all eligible adults should receive uh, a third dose of a vaccine after completing their primary series. And the current recommendation is that if you are five months or so out from your primary series, to get a booster dose. And for those who are immune compromised, a fourth dose is now recommended for those individuals 12 years and older, as well as for all adults above the age of 50. The next trials are looking at the impact of COVID-19 vaccines on antibody and T cell responses. Um, the first study will be looking at uh, Johnson and Johnson, Johnson and Johnson COVID-19 booster administered six months after two doses of uh, primary regimen in, uh, involving the Pfizer vaccine trial. And then the next one would look at people who were vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine uh, and boosted with either the uh, homologous with the Pfizer vaccine or heterologous with um, um, ad COVID-2, which is a Johnson and Johnson vaccine. In these studies, they compared the humoral and cellular immune responses in individuals who received the third dose or booster dose with either the Johnson & Johnson shot or the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine shot greater than six months after receiving the two dose series of Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So this was a heterologous compared to homologous booster vaccine in individuals who were primed with the Pfizer vaccine and were at least six months out from their primary series. This was a phase two study and included 65 individuals who were already enrolled in ongoing studies or added to participate in this study. Exclusion criteria here were history of SARS-CoV-2 infections so as not to confound immunogenicity assessments and also those who'd received other COVID-19 vaccines or who received immune suppressive medications. In these studies, the median age was about 34 to 36, 21 to 32 percent were female, and the racial ethnic demographics are as shown. Regarding underlying medical conditions, about 22 percent of those in the Johnson & Johnson booster study were obese, about 10 percent hypertension, and similarly in the Pfizer-BioNTech group, the comorbidity mix was about 8 percent had hypertension, and another 8% had diabetes. So some of these individuals um, certainly had underlying comorbidities. The median days from second vaccine to boost was about 235 or 254 for each of these groups respectively. Now these figures show the humoral immune responses following Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer-BioNTech boosting. Remember that we're comparing homologous boosting to a heterologous boosting. And so the neutralizing antibody titers were measured at week zero, and then two weeks, and then four weeks post-booster vaccination. And in this trial, they assessed both neutralizing antibody titers, but also antibody titers as measured by an ELISA. And so looking at the data, they assessed neutralizing antibody titers and antibodies that were targeting the different variants of concern, the original strain, and then the delta in the light green, and the beta in the dark green. And so we clearly see in these studies that there was a boost as evidenced by antibody titers at week two and week four compared to week zero, which was time of study entry. 
Similarly, for Pfizer-BioNTech, we also see boosted antibody responses two to four weeks after. We will note some subtle differences that it appeared that for neutralizing antibody titers, that the recipients of the JNG boost appeared to still continue to rise through week four. However, for recipients of the mRNA Pfizer-BioNTech trial, they appear to peak at week two and already start to experience a subtle decline as of week four. So the peak times appear to be different. Similarly, for the antibody assays by ELISA, similar phenomenon was noted where the JNJ boosted recipients still continue to experience an increase in titers up to week four, while the Pfizer-BioNTech recipients peaked at two weeks and started to experience a decline at four weeks. Now, this slide assessed cellular immune responses following Johnson & Johnson Pfizer-BioNTech boosting. So same cohort, but this time looking at T-cell responses specifically. Here, they looked at CD8 responses to your left and CD4 T-cell responses to your right. These assays were done over a two-week period. And two weeks post-boost, again, there were increases in interferon-producing CD8 T-cells activated specific for anti-spike among both those who received a J&J boost and a Pfizer-BioNTech boost. It appeared that quantitatively, the boost of the CD8 T cells for Johnson & Johnson booster recipients was higher than that of Pfizer-BioNTech. They remained comparable for CD4 T cells with regards to the different variants of concerns and response to boosts. So putting these data together, Johnson and Johnson booster increased neutralizing and binding antibodies similar to boosting with the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. However, it appeared that Johnson and Johnson booster recipients showed stronger T cell responses, specifically CD8 T cell responses. So this data suggests that heterologous boosting, which is mix and match, may generate different both quantitative and breadth of humoral and cell mediated immune responses than a homologous boosting. The next article we're going to talk about is also looking at homologous and heterologous COVID-19 booster vaccinations, but this study differs from the prior study in that we're going to be looking at the different mRNA vaccine uh, approaches as well as uh, the viral vector Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So the purpose of this study was to compare homologous boosters to heterologous boosters in fully vaccinated recipients. This was a phase one to two non-randomized open label study conducted at 10 sites in the United States. And in this study enrolled were people who had no history of COVID-19 infection and had not received monoclonal antibody infusions. Any one of these could have received either a Moderna, Johnson & Johnson vaccine and Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And then they were going to receive either homologous boosting with the same vaccine or heterologous boosting with the other two vaccines. Adults 18 years or older who had completed their COVID-19 vaccine regimen greater than 12 weeks or three months earlier were included in this study. The key population characteristics are shown. The median duration post-primary series ranged from 14 to 24 weeks. It's nice to see that females were represented a significant portion, sometimes half of the cohorts, but no less than a third. The mean age of participants was roughly upper 40s to mid 50s. The racial ethnic demographic spread is here. Note that the representation of Blacks in this study was huge, as 80 to almost 90% of participants across the board were those of Black race. So this study shows the fold increases in binding antibodies, the geometric mean titers of binding antibodies to the left, as well as the pseudovirus neutralizing antibody assays to the right. In the light blue are those who have been primed with JNJ. In the dark blue are those who were primed with Moderna. And in yellow are those who were primed with Pfizer-BioNTech. To identify those who had heterologous boosting, we're looking at the broken green dots, and for those who received homologous boosting, we see the broken red dots. And so let's highlight a few things from these slides. Let's look to the left, the binding antibody titers. It's pretty clear here that the persons that experienced the greatest fold increase in antibody titers were those who were primed with JNJ, such that if they were primed with JNJ 
and they received heterologous vaccination, they experienced anything from 34 fold to 55 fold increase if they got Pfizer versus Moderna respectively. However, when you look at those who received a J&J booster, it appeared that there was barely any difference between those who were primed with different vaccine strategies. We see a similar pattern to the right, looking at pseudovirus neutralizing antibody assays, where again, you see the highest full change in individuals who were primed with J&J, but received mRNA vaccines. And it appears that for those who received mRNA vaccines, there were also quite significant differences between those who received the Pfizer-BioNTech primary but received another mRNA booster. So to summarize the findings in this study, it's pretty clear that heterologous boosters, particularly GNG recipients who received mRNA, experienced quite significant increase in neutralizing antibodies by a factor of 6 to 73. And when you compare that to homologous boosters, a factor of 4 to 20. And as we mentioned, that those who were GNG primary recipients who received mRNA boosters tend to have the greatest increase. Again, the caveat with these kind of studies that the fold increase in antibodies titers are not the same as observed clinical outcomes. And so these data should be perceived as such. We do know that T cell responses tend to be much more robust in the ability to neutralize variants of concern. Hence the interest in T cell responses, spike specific T cell responses were known as to be highest in the JNJ prime group regardless of boosters suggesting a little bit of an advantage with that vaccine approach. Reassuringly, there was an acceptable safety profile for these mix and match vaccine approaches. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please make sure to claim your CME credits by completing the post-test and evaluation form at the link on the screen. And make sure to follow Bonham CE on Twitter to stay tuned for more COVID-19 vaccine content.